I think we are live now. Welcome everyone to Extremely Together Digital Discussions. Uh, today we are having a great and beautiful uh, young leader. Uh, please welcome with me uh, Ms. Jayatma. She is the United Nations uh, General Secretary, uh, Secretary General's Envoy on Youth. Uh, she is the youngest lady to, to, to be in such a position. So uh, welcome Jayatma for uh, today's session. And uh, let us uh, remind our uh, fans and attendees that uh, this session is the last one among uh, the Extremely Together digital uh, discussion series uh, in which we aim to, uh, you know, gather uh, young people, uh, bring young people together to, to dialogue with experts, uh, share their voices, pave the path forward. Is this possible? Is this only? Of course not. So, uh, you know, Jayatma, it's, uh, uh, it's not only about, you know, going down, drop a comment and that's it. No, we are collecting all these uh, comments, all these uh, views, uh, the, our, uh, you know, expert uh, comments, and most important, uh, the survey uh, results to develop a policy note and then keep nagging, you know, on, on the policymakers to uh, get the youth more involved and to, 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 to get their voices heard. So, please, guys, if, if you are uh, watching us through Blue Jeans, uh, drop your questions in the Q&A uh, uh, button. If you are watching us through Facebook, uh, please use the hashtag ET uh, discussions and uh, drop down your comments so that Jayatma will, uh, will answer all, all, all the questions that are related to, to our topic today. And most important, if you didn't, uh, take the survey yet, take one minute, fill it in, support us, and let us get our voices heard. So, today's session will be divided into two halves, uh, Jayatma. Welcome, Fatima. My, my, uh, our colleague Fatima, I didn't introduce her. She is extremely together young leader also. Uh, she was late because of the Wi-Fi uh, connections <laughs> issue. So, uh, welcome, Fatima. Uh, I was telling, uh, guys that uh, our sessions today will be divided into two halves. The first half will be the discussion with our beautiful young lady Jayatma, while the second half will be a Q&A session uh, in which we will uh, deliver the uh, comments, the questions of, of our attendees to Jayatma to answer them. Uh, and also uh, we will be using them to develop our uh, policy notes. So guys, today is your chance. This is the last session. And the mic is with you, uh, Fatima and Jayatma. Uh, Jayatma. Go ahead and start with our great uh, and beautiful lady. Thank you so much, Zaid. Apologies for being five minutes late to ET's digital discussions. My digital platform wasn't working. So as you can see, we are definitely live. A very warm welcome to our friend Jayatma and everybody who's watching on Facebook and uh and Blue Jeans Live. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna kick right off and talk about <coughs> youth concerns. Jathma, as the youth envoy, I'm sure you've had lots of young people's concerns brought to you over the course of this pandemic. And I wanted to give a bit of a background as to what ET has discovered during our first sessions with young people. We've been exploring with our participants, the effects of the pandemic, how it is affecting young people's lives and their efforts to prevent violent extremism. And to that end, we ran a global survey, a global consultation to understand how COVID-19 has affected them. And chief among those survey results was that COVID-19 has exp exposed and fueled racial, socioeconomic and gender discrimination. It has aggravated pre-existing inequalities and many uh, exacerbated and in many places exacerbated marginalization, the lack of opportunities and state violence and coercion. And I'm sure you're also aware that COVID-19 has provided fertile ground for extremist organizations to strengthen their presence and to take advantage of the uncertainty and fear that young people are facing during this pandemic. However, in addition to all of this and the misinformation that has been fueled by hatred and exclusion, the crisis of the system is also an entry point for deep, 
long-term transformation in which everyone can make a contribution. And this is a very collective challenge, which I'm sure you're very aware of. And you know what they say, I always tell Zaid this, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together, extremely together. So my first question to you is, I know you've also been consulting your wide youth network in this time of COVID. What are some of the key challenges that you've heard from the young people that you've spoken with in, re in relation to peace and social cohesion? What is your biggest concern as youth envoy? And what do you think are the long-term effects of COVID on peace and social cohesion? Fantastic. A tough one, but... <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's definitely a million dollar question, but I'll try, try to answer it uh, to the best of my, my ability. First of all, good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone, uh, to both of you, Zaid and Fatima, but also to all of those who are watching us from around the world. I hope you're safe and you're healthy and you're taking care of yourself um, and others around you. Um, it's, it's certainly not been an easy time for any of us. I think every one of us have been coping differently with the, with the pandemic and its um, different short term and long term outcomes. But it's been really inspiring to see young people coming together, as Fatima said, to use this opportunity as an entry point for transformation. So I, I really congratulate extremely together and all of you for gathering the troops and really also coming together to hold us because I, Part of me thinks I'm part of you, and another part of me is a part of the UN. So you are, you really, uh, also, <laughs> you really also got us to, you know, join, join your force and, and, and support you, but at the same time as institutions to hold us accountable for the work that we are doing at this very crucial point of our, uh, our history. Um, in terms of the concerns, Fatima, I think, you know, the concerns that you and I and Said have as young people living in very uncertain times has been very real for young people around the world. Um, those who are in the informal economy, those who are unemployed, those who just graduated, um, you know, have been really facing dire situations and dire circumstances. Um, mental health challenges have skyrocketed in, in the UK itself. 82% of young people um, have reported that their mental health has gotten worse during the pandemic. And, and this is only the tip of the iceberg. And I think we'll see most of these impacts kind of resulting in different ways in the in the coming months and years but since your question was very specific to peace and security i'll try to maybe double down on that and and, and share with you some of the reflections i've heard uh, over the past couple of months and one of the things i think in terms of social cohesion um the pandemic has really um how would i say we have a saying in my language where you know you 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 make a system naked so you kind of, you know, remove all the covers and you expose what's inside. Um, and it has really done that. And then we've seen how the existing inequalities within our societies, within our systems, within our countries have been exacerbated. People of color, people who uh, are economically in the in the back end, people who belong to minority groups have been the ones who are most affected by the pandemic. Those groups who are traditionally marginalized, traditionally vulnerable, has even more uh, been uh, challenged by the pandemic. So this has certainly opened up a lot of people's eyes and ears into understanding what structural and systemic inequalities are. And as a result, I think a lot of people have also decided to take a stance on, on it, right? So we see these kind of ongoing protests in the US and, and in Europe, in other parts of the world, people out on the streets in some parts of the Balkans, in, in Serbia, for an example, uh, calling for reforms. And uh, you see also in, in um, basically around the world, people are um, even during the pandemic coming out and, and really demanding for those changes. Um, so I think in terms of sort of peace as we know it will also be very much thought through during the pandemic. What does it really mean to be peaceful? And and you guys know this. When we ask young people, what does peace mean to you? You hardly get the answer of absence of conflict, right? Peace is a lot of things. Peace is to be able to live in a democracy. Peace is to be able to freely express yourself. So I think the pandemic in that way has kind of exposed that part of the spectrum. And secondly, I think we have also seen what bad leadership can do. Many of our, you know, very sort of stronghold countries with the 
sometimes strong man leadership are, are not really showing the leadership that we need to see with with empathy with truth and with decisiveness um, and that has exposed a leadership gap which i think is also very crucial when we talk about um, building peace and, and social cohesion in societies and lastly i think also the groups that you mentioned that the extremist groups or violent groups um, either it is in the political spectrum uh, they have also used this opportunity to kind of further marginalize and further discriminate specific groups of people so for an example in societies we have seen how COVID has been used as a tool to, so you basically link COVID with a group that you don't like, and then you couple it and then you further discriminate them. And for an example, in my country, there was a situation where in the very early days, COVID was affiliated to Muslim communities, you know, saying that, oh, it's, it's actually the Muslim people who are bringing the disease. And then after a while it was, you know, in, in a Navy camp, it, it broke out and then it was affiliated, oh, it's the Navy that is responsible for COVID. And, and these are just some examples that I've seen in my own country, but we have also seen, for an example, discrimination of people of Asian descent in, in the US or in Europe uh, and, and African people in China. Uh, and we've seen this kind of, you know, labeling, putting the COVID label on minorities, putting the COVID label on uh, people that you don't like and kind of trying to use that as another barrier to, to, to further discriminate them. Um, and in terms of your second question on the long term consequences, one of the things that I'm really, really worried about is the over securitization of COVID, you know, so in many countries, the military is being used to execute lockdown measures, uh, strong curfews and, and you know, strong new emergency laws which really um, can be used as crackdown tools to crack down human rights activists, to silence, silence people um, who, are, who are having a dissenting opinion, um, and to really close down civic spaces. Civic spaces were already shrinking before the pandemic, and the, in, in a way, securitization of the pandemic has given an opportunity to most states, but also some non-state actors to um, really limit that those civic spaces and, and, and people from, from participating. Uh, second thing that I worry about in terms of a long-term effect is the global education crisis that has resulted from the pandemic. You know, we have about a billion young people out of school um, and this is a huge number. We know education plays a key role in tackling extremism, in building peace. And Fatima, you have worked extensively on this topic in, in schools and in communities. Um, so this lack of access to education during the pandemic can bring a multitude of issues. And I think one of them is certainly going to be making young people more and more vulnerable um, to different ideologies. And, and lastly, um, I think also another issue that will affect peace and security in, in a long-term sense is the lack of trust now people are uh, having towards political institutions because your your presidents, your prime ministers, your politicians are, are not really trying to take care of citizens. They're more concerned about the economy. They're more concerned about their political gain and their image and their PR. And that pushes people away from institutions. And we know that the lack of trust between citizens and institutions is a key push factor for young people to join extremist groups. So in terms of long-term effects, I think over securitization, the global education crisis, and, and this lack of trust that is kind of bubbling out is going to be some of the issues that we'll have to tackle as a generation uh, coming out of the, the pandemic. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jasma. I am always left in awe of your ability to speak truth to power. And, and that's particularly one of the reasons we're holding this conversation it is to get our demands put on the record and to have it advocated through you. Um, over to Zaid. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, uh, especially, uh, you know, uh, when you, Jayasma, mentioned that, you know, um, unfortunately, some groups um, related the, the COVID-19 to some ethnicities. You know, uh, we have recorded uh, this for Syrian refugees in, in, in some places. And, you know, all, all, all uh, what you said is, is should, should push us more and more to stay extremely together. Um, you know, Jayatma, in, 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 in our previous sessions, uh, we focused on uh, youth-led uh, solutions to polarization and uh, tensions, uh, you know, resulting from uh, COVID-19. 
uh, it's clear that young people, even though they have been limited in the, in the peace building and the, you know, PVE work due to the, the, the restrictions of the pandemic and the COVID-19, have been very creative in, in their responses to the, you know, uh, to the divisions increased by, by the crisis. Not only youth, but, you know, all our, uh, all humanity, frankly. So uh, we have heard many examples of, of how young people have been uh, creating space for uh, increased understanding and dialogue among uh, different communities, promoting, uh, you know, our common identity as a human beings, uh, fighting polarization and, uh, you know, uh, con uh, conspiracy uh, theories online. In addition, you know, our, our consultations also brought to light the unique uh, capacities young people bring to build a better future. Uh, young people are, you know, they are collective in, 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 in the way uh, to work. Uh, they bring different actors together for change. Uh, their uh, spontaneity also makes uh, them more agile to respond to such, you know, a massive disruption in, in, in our social and in economic relations. And in, in, in this occasion, I, I want to ask you, like, uh, we have been focusing on, on youth-led initiatives. What about our other ages? What, uh, you know, from your uh, position and work, uh, what good examples you, uh, you, you have for, for us, you know, that will inspire us uh, more and more? And also, uh, I, I want your view on, on how youth ideas can lead uh, to intergenerational processes of change. You know, uh, Jayatma and, and, and Fatum, as, as, uh, as we know that for change to happen, uh, we need a wide range of, of people to join, to join forces. So what's your view, uh, Jayatma? Yeah, I mean, um, let me take your first question, and I completely agree with you. Um, one of the things that I really struggled is during the first few weeks in, in March, whenever I was watching news, I saw these um, on mainstream media, which they were showing pictures of young people in pool parties and in beaches, and was building this narrative that young people are the ones who are spreading the virus and they're not being affected by it. So they're very careless. They don't care about their elders. And, and that was the image that was in, in mainstream media. And I, I felt really uncomfortable with about it because a lot of the times our narrative about young people tend to be focusing on the small minority of young people who are not responsible or who are not, um, say, um, violent, for an example. So um, we always highlight those stories, but we never highlight the overwhelming majority of young people who are actually staying inside their homes, who are actually practicing social guidance, who are actually not only helping themselves, but also their communities. So I started this search for positive stories to counter the narrative that the mainstream media was building. And what I found was that my assumption was actually true. And I, I came across over 110 stories of young people responding to COVID in their own communities. And I decided these stories need to be heard. So I started writing a blog every week. So every Friday, I, I write a blog highlighting 10 of these stories. And I try to push them out as much as possible so that we show that whatever the image and the narrative that is being showcased in the mainstream media is not actually true. I think one of the real example for that is you guys. You know, you're extremely together is working on, say, PVE or CVE, protecting young people from violent extremism. But when COVID hit, you guys actually wanted to respond to COVID and, and find opportunities within this pandemic to bring your message across, right? And that is exactly the kind of creativity and that is exactly the kind of innovation we see around the world. I'll give you a few examples. Uh, there's this amazing young woman called Vemin Muganda. I think she should be part of Extremely Together. So if you guys haven't reached out to her already, I highly recommend. She's from Kenya. She's in Mombasa. She works on her community, a prevention of violent extremism of young, particularly young men and women in her community. And immediately after the COVID crisis hit, she adapted her organization to be able to spread correct information in her community about COVID, to distribute PPE, to distribute hand sanitizer, to distribute food for those who are in need, and was really able to immediately transform her priorities into what is the most 
crucial need in her community. And this is what we see across the board. Youth organizations are very flexible. They are very agile. They do not have, you know, hierarchies of directors and deputy directors and assistant directors and boards. They, they can make decisions with their peers very quickly. They can adapt. They are very agile. So they, they immediately change their priorities. There's a young man called Achaleke in Cameroon who works on rehabilitation of prisoners, but he immediately changed his youth center into a hand sanitizer production center. So they're they are doing DIY hand sanitizer production in his office space, which used to be a youth peace building organization. There is a youth group in, in South Sudan, a young man, his name is Nelson Kwaje. He immediately used, he's, he's working on technology, on social media, on platforms to bring people together and he immediately changed the priorities to tackle misinformation. They brought together the, the, the influencers in South Sudan and the UN and other news agencies and created a WhatsApp group, immediately checking and verifying news before anything was posted on their platforms. So this is another uh, example. The Youth Peace and Security Coalition in Jordan uh, also started, you know, uh, putting their other projects aside and immediately responding to protecting young people, disseminating information. We've seen young refugees doing the same in the Kakuma camp, in the Kutupalon camp and, 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 and in many other places. So if you're interested in, in being inspired by these stories, I highly recommend reading my blog. It has uh, every week it has 10 blogs, uh, 10 stories featured. And uh, we also did two special editions on young LGBTIQ activists and young refugees uh, to show how they, in their own communities, also uh, try to stay resilient, try to inspire others to be resilient and, and really responding in the front lines to uh, to people who, who need them. So. I think if we look at examples and experiences, there's plenty and there's many, uh, but as usual, um, young people are doing this with minimal resources, like zero budget and, and yeah. no staff and no office space, like, like all of us, like how we started our work, right? And I think what needs to come out of this pandemic is, and I've been advocating a lot on that, International community has to also reconsider their funding priorities because we have seen very clearly whenever there is a crisis, it's not the UN, it's not the big NGOs that really make a difference in the ground. It's the youth organizations, it's the women's organizations, it's the community organizations. So if you want to have an effective, immediate response, it's those organizations that you need to empower. So more resources and, and more support and more um, more basically platforms for those grassroots youth led organizations to thrive is one of the things that I, I would really like to get across today um, while sharing those really great examples. Um, that I would say also opens up the conversation into the second part of uh, what you were asking inside, what, what are the different stakeholders can do and how can intergenerational leadership come into play? Um, I think obviously compared to say 2010 or 2011 when I started working with the Youth Council in Sri Lanka and kind of, you know, kind of made my way into the youth space. Compared to that, we do have a lot of, I would say, dialogue right now among the different generations. Um, but I think when it really comes to translating those dialogues and conversations into concrete action and concrete policy, there is still a very big gap. Um, in certain countries, we've seen youth parliaments or youth advisory groups or these kind of different structures. Some of them actually mainstreamed into the formal processes, but some of them a bit ad hoc. Um, but, but I don't think we have yet figured out what exactly that intergenerational co-leadership means. Obviously, the benefits of having intergenerational co-leadership, um, I think everyone understands, everyone knows, by engaging young people in conversations, in making decisions, in implementing programs, you're also creating ownership for future generations to you know, take forward all of the good things that are being done today. and. On top of that, young people do have a right to participate in decisions that affect our lives, right? But uh, but in terms of really institutionalizing that and, and getting that across, I think it, we, we still haven't really found the right 
No, I, I take that back. I was going to say we haven't found the right formula, but I think we, we have found the formula. It's just, I think, the lack of political will on the side of many times institutions and political leaders that prevent young people from actively participating. Thank you. Thank you, Jayatma, for such inspirational, you know, uh, examples. Uh, and I advise all, all, all our uh, attendees to, to, to go to the blog and, and read such inspirational examples. You know, I, I myself had uh, a colleague also from Jordan. She, she, uh, uh, she had her own brand for beauty creams and these things. And when the pandemic just, you know, started, she also transferred everything to uh, sanitizer and, you know, hygiene uh, products. And she uh, spread the, the, the products freely for, in, in her village and, and, and city. So, you know, we feel, we really feel we are still good, you know, and we can do better and better and, you know, uh, make our uh, world also a better place for all of us by such uh, nice examples. So uh, now I think we will move to uh, Fatima. Fatima, with you again. Thanks, Zaid. Um... Jathma, I one of the highlights I have to admit is looking forward to your blog and I wish we could talk about all 110 stories just on this call. Um, and I hope, you know, this conversation is one one for your blog as well about um, us coming together, bringing the extremely together community, our Facebook community, our Blue Jeans community to have this very important conversation. Um, you've highlighted, you know, the massive number of inequalities that exist um, that are being exacerbated by um, by this pandemic with youth at the forefront. Um, the long-term impacts will absolutely be generational. Every conversation I've had um, in the PBE space has been that actually the recovery from COVID will not be months, it will be years and if not decades. So, you know, we're having this conversation now, but in 10 years time, when we're in positions of, of leadership, um, I would definitely like to look back and hope that we don't uh, fall victim to some of the mistakes of, of present leaders that you've highlighted. So I'm, I very much welcome, welcome that intervention. I want to move on to talking about that gap that you mentioned about young people being dynamic, being um, fluid and being able to move one day from a peace building organization to a PPE production organization. How do we translate our activism and our dynamism into opportunity. This crisis, um, you know, I said earlier, within crisis, there is always opportunity. I definitely want to look on the positive side of things. So how can we shape the world that we want, um, you know, where we're clearing the structural discriminations and inequalities that we're seeing? And I know for a fact from the young people that we've been talking to that young people are coming up with recommendations to put to their leaders. Um, based on our online survey, we've had um, a number of recommendations and the, the clear theme throughout that is that young people are calling for more social justice more than ever before to a lot of the you know human rights infringes and and violations of democracy that you've mentioned to support marginalized communities and uh, equitable opportunities for all young people also want national and global leaders to be involved um, to involve young people and vulnerable groups not just at the implementation phase as an afterthought when it comes to policy making but be at the heart of decision making um, from policy creation. And they're also demanding a more collaborative and inclusive political process where there is transparency and accountability. Now I want to specifically ask you about your Lead the New Normal campaign, which I've been following on your social medias. Um, what are the demands um, that young people have formulated through the Lead the New Normal campaign? And what is your advice to us and the young people online today, uh, who by the way are sending lots of questions into you, um, how best can we share our concerns and our solutions with the decision makers and how best can we influence post-COVID reforms in our respective countries? Yes, I mean, um, one of the things, actually the Lead the New Normal campaign was, um, in, the inception of the campaign was before COVID-19. As you know, the UN is celebrating its 75th birthday this year. So the UN is 75 years old, but it's constantly looking to be young and it's constantly trying to find ways to be, be modern and to be agile and, and to be able to respond to today's issues, right? Because the organization was founded 75 years ago in a completely different political environment. The countries who were powerful those days and the countries who had, um, you know, all the resources those days are not the ones that are the most powerful right now sometimes or the challenges that it sought to solve um, are not the challenges 
challenges we are trying to solve right now uh, in in fact the number of challenges that the un is entrusted to solve has increased from maintaining global peace and security and, and human rights into now to education to health to um climate change to artificial intelligence to digital technologies and it, and it has just evolved the challenges has evolved so much but as an organization the un hasn't been able to keep up with that speed so what i wanted to do through the campaign was to really spark a conversation about the relevance of international cooperation and multilateralism as the un celebrates its 75th anniversary and get young people to contribute to actually giving ideas and, and solutions to as to how the system can can move forward with reforms and, and with changes that are quite essential for today's world but then covid hit us all by surprise and, and we kind of had to kind of rethink what that priority is going to be and, and we thought we'll immediately um, ask young people how exactly as both of you said how can we use COVID-19 as an opportunity really to bring about that change we anyway wanted to bring to our, our, our old bureaucratic hierarchical systems, right? So we asked um, young people to submit their ideas and um, we've got thousands uh, of, uh, tens of thousands of uh, sub submissions through videos, through essays and, and so on. So I, I asked my team to summarize some of those points. So I, I wanted to not far paraphrase them, but to tell you like in a very raw manner what some of those ideas were. Uh, one of the key ideas that came across was that we need to reinvent and rebuild a world for all people and our planet at the core. Uh, second was skilled leadership, political will and collective leadership. I think a lot of this you also mentioned that were the results of the survey and, and you can really see a lot of parallels here. Third was not to violate human rights. Fourth was, we must prioritize a sustainable world as we rebuild communities and eco economic systems. So uh, to return into local food systems, supporting green renewable energy, clean air and clean water to protect people from some of the risk factors, uh, not just related to COVID, but also climate change. Underscoring international coordination and the best available science, universal health care and equitable access, mental health services, promoting equal access to essential services for young people, in particular, the diverse intersectional youth identities, such as young refugees, young migrants, LGBTQI young people. So these are some of, in the broad strokes, I would say the, the key um, asks that we received from young people when we asked what does leading the new normal mean to them and i think here you can draw a lot of uh, similarities to the issues that we discussed before and, and came through your survey as well i think at the end of the day what young people are asking for is better governance systems in our countries it's it's asking for better leadership it's asking for inclusive decision making it's asking for not reactive but proactive policies um, and, and it's really getting people's voices to decide for people themselves what's best for them right um, and and this speaks a lot to i think again going back to the question on the lack of trust towards political institutions and and you can really see it across these different priorities and and why and how young people are frustrated that our political leaders are not not really acting um, to bring about these sustainable changes they want to see in, in, in their own countries or in the world. Um, so yes, I, I see a lot of parallels between the submissions that we have received and, and, and you have received uh, through your survey. And I think this also gives us, um, it strengthens, I think, our pri priorities and our key asks and, and really gives legitimacy and credibility to the policy papers that you guys will put together and validates that this is actually what the wider group of young people in this generation requires and demands from our leaders of today. Wonderful. Um, I'm so glad that actually um, our findings match yours um, and it, it provides robust data that young people care. Uh, you know, our demand to uh, our leaders is that, you know, if you cannot step up and serve the needs of young people, then you must step aside. Um, in that vein, I, um, I will be very cheeky and ask Jethma on the spot 
you know we're putting this uh, policy note together. We would welcome your support in making sure that it gets in front of the UN Secretary General and, and the relevant stakeholders to make sure that we can advocate for young people's voices at some of the highest levels and circles in which you operate. Um, you can say no, but I'm still going to ask. <laughs> you can count on my full support. We can, uh, I will definitely, once you send me the, the, the paper, I will send it to the Secretary General and, and the leadership uh, here at the UN. Uh, but also I will help you map out some of the um, key events that we will be also having throughout this year. For an example, in September, we will have a youth plenary for, to celebrate the UN 75th anniversary. And there are some strategic opportunities that I think you can also use your policy paper as an advocacy tool to, to you know, again, make this, this very valid uh, recommendations. Good. Fantastic. You heard it here, guys. Commitment from the UN Youth Envoy herself. <laughs> Back to you, Zaid. Yeah. yeah, so uh, great news. Uh, we look forward for, uh, you know, Jayatma's support always. So, uh, Jayatma, you know, uh, we still have a lot of points uh, that we want to discuss. But uh, unfortunately, the first half of the of the uh, session is is done, and uh, you know now I think we should give the right to our uh, attendees to to uh, to ask. So guys, please, if you are uh, watching us uh, through the uh, blue jeans, uh, drop your question in the Q and A. And if you are watching us through the Facebook, uh, please uh, also drop your comment question and uh, use the hashtag ET discussions. And uh, Fatima, I think the first uh, question is uh, uh, directed to, to, for us, extremely together, uh, is, uh, from Sarma Sheikh. He's from Pakistan, and he is asking, you know, uh, to, he, he, he wants to know more about Extremely Together and the workshops we, we are doing. So, uh, Sarmad, uh, as, as we mentioned at the beginning of, of uh, this session, that uh, this is a part of series uh, that, you know, are extremely together hold to gather and uh, to uh, collect the views, the, the, the voices of, of youth people, take uh, the consultation from, uh, you know, our guests, our speakers, uh, who are experts in, in this field. And then we will use all these to develop a policy note. And this policy note, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we will keep nagging wherever we will see a policymaker so that to let, uh, we will tell him, please, we are the youth. We sh our voices should be heard more. We should be uh, integrated better in the, in the, in the policy making process and in the peace building issue. So uh, this is the uh, uh, reply to to Sarmad, and I think the second question, Fatima, uh, for uh, for Jayatma and also for for, for us, uh, it it focuses it's from uh, Haya Haya Qiyase. It focuses on the um, or what's the view from your side, Jayatma? You know, with the current uh, you know digital transformation. Uh, and you know the robotic automation and blah blah blah. So this maybe will 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 lead to uh, lesser or or less job opportunities, especially for 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 youth. Uh, but I, I think you already mentioned that we should uh, look at, at at the pandemic as as an opportunity. Uh, what's your comment on 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 this uh, on this uh, point? It's it's a very specific question. So is it uh, related to COVID or is, is it in general a question around will automation it's, make us lose yeah. our jobs? Yeah, you know that the, you know there is a digital transformation started not not now maybe started like few years ago and this leads to 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 lower the job opportunities, uh, especially for for youth. So yeah. this adds, you know, more tension or or more load yeah. even on on us as as youth. Yeah. Yes. No, I, I just wanted because I had two points in mind. One is, of course, with the crisis, um, the unemployment rates have skyrocketed. We already had, uh, you know, really grim statistics about youth unemployment and underemployment around the world. And um, a young person is three times more likely to be unemployed than an oh. older person. So, you know, youth un unemployment has always disproportionately affected young people. And this is due to a multitude of factors. You know, when you when you get out of school, you can't really translate your education into skills. So issues with the skill mismatch between job markets and, and the, the graduates, um, but also, you know, 
we have a huge population of young people and and by 2030 we had to create at least 600 million new jobs if we were to accommodate all these young people in the job market um so there are structural demographical different le levels of barriers to youth unemployment itself but on the specific question on digital transformation and jobs i really don't have the specific statistics for that but i've seen multiple researchers like certain researchers show that automation can actually open up new industries and new jobs yeah. therefore yeah. even if you lose say uh, jobs in a production line where you would be say sewing a, a button in a shirt in a garment factory but you there might be other job opportunities that open on the technology field and in in, in industries that are being kind of strengthened through technology and there are also there are estimations if i recall correctly it was a research done by mckenzie that kind of said you know the number of jobs that are being lost will be kind of equal to the number of jobs that will open up but there are also certain researches and 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 um, assumptions that says that it might create a gap and it might create unemployment for a lot of people particularly the low skilled or unskilled labor who who are uh, kind of working in in manufacturing and production type of jobs um but then again um uh, these are sort of you know not, none of this is um, I don't think any of this is like completely true because it's all based on assumptions of at which rate technology will develop and at which rate different industries will be automated. Um, however, one of the opportunities I see in the crisis is that um, we are all moving towards a world that is increasingly becoming uninhabitable because of climate change. So there is a strong need for us to switch from the way that we do our day-to-day -day business from say from coal or fossil fuel into transitioning into renewable energies so when that transition happens from coal and fossil fuel into renewable energies that's going to open up millions more jobs and that is an opportunity to really not only bring our world into a more climate friendly more sustainable pathway but it's also an opportunity to create new jobs and and provide employment to young people so um it's it's i'm sorry i'm not able to give a yes or no answer but i think uh, this is the sort of information that is available to us for us to be able to make those decisions and let me let me wrap up by saying i have a slogan where i say you know young people should be able to not just receive education in school and university they need to be able to acquire skills that are flexible that are adaptable so analytical skills critical thinking skills communication skills and skills to learn to learn through you know our entire lives we are going to live with this transformation this technological transformation we are talking about is going to happen through our lifetime so there'll be certain points in our life where we'll have to learn where we'll have to unlearn where we'll have to relearn where we'll have to skill unskill upskill reskill ourselves therefore we need the basic skills we will need these those analytical and critical thinking skills the best example i show is my job my job didn't exist when i was in school um you know the the the, the this, this is just an example, but there's going to be so many new industries, new opportunities, new platforms that that will not even exist while you are in school. So you, so we need to have the the ability to have those skills that can help us learn throughout our life cycle to be able to be ready to grab those opportunities by hand whenever yeah. they are presented in front of us. And, and I think Jayatma, a lot of a lot of us look at at, at the COVID-19 or the pandemic as as an opportunity. We have noticed that you know the the interest in, in, in entrepreneurship work and in, or entrepreneurship uh, skills have have increased, and this by itself will create uh, job opportunities. Will 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 transform the youth from uh, job seeking to job creators. So uh, all all these points. Uh, Again, you know, we, we should look at the pandemic as, as an opportunity. Uh, Fatima, what, what's the next question? What do you have for us? I've got a number of questions, um, and but I'm conscious of time, so I will try and uh, combine a couple of them for you, Jayathma. Mm -hmm. But on the education point, um, you know, personally, I'm very invested in making sure um, the equality of opportunity through education is there and the removal of social barriers 
or barriers to entry is, is there. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, I know you've had a very busy week and from Extremely together and the um, all of our participants today, we want to congratulate you on passing the third youth peace and security um, resolution in the Security Council sure, this week. <laughs> to, to, to your hard works for leading us there, thank you so much. Um, one question is around specifically the resolution that passed this week. For those of you who don't know, it is resolution 2535. It is the third youth peace and security um, resolution um, to come from Jayathma's uh, sort of office uh, and building on previous resolutions. So the first question is, please tell us a little bit about your efforts this week. And the second uh, link to that is, what is the big difference with this resolution, the third iteration to the previous versions of this resolution? Thank you very much. This is my kind of question. I'm I'm a bit of a UN nerd. So whenever somebody asks me about like what is the difference between this and that and that structure and this structure, I, I love to brag. <laughs> so get ready. Yeah. Um, no, I, I mean, mean I think I think it's a I think it's a great uh, victory certainly for all of us who are working on peace and security and um, this resolution is for me very important in a way that it's the most action oriented resolution to date. So when you ask me what are the differences, um, I'll go back to 2015 and resolution 2250 was more about um, establishing the notion in the council that young people are positive actors for peace building. And you know, all, all throughout the narrative was that young people are part of extremist groups, mostly young men, and young women are victims. And this is the kind of narrative we've seen in through the council's deliberation over the past decades. And 2250 resolution really did a good job in terms of anchoring in the council young people as positive agents of change and, and positive uh, peace builders. Um, that resolution also laid the foundation and the principles of what it means for young people to be engaged in peace and security conversations. So the five pillars in the 2250 resolution, protection, partnerships, prevention, disintegration, reintegration, uh, and participation are considered the sort of the five pillars of which youth peace and security is built on. So if you ask me, I would analyze 20 to 50 as a more normative resolution, which, which really highlights the principles of engagement of young people. And then the 20 to 50 resolution um, called for a, uh, a study on what it is uh, to reaffirm that notion and that narrative to do a study on young people and peace and security. So the, there was a progress study done by an independent author called Graham Simpson. Uh, some yeah, of you might have been in, 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 in uh, with you guys, and uh, you can go and read. It. It's called uh, the Missing Piece, um, and it's about um, it's a huge study that we did across. Um, I think more than 4,000 young people were involved in the consultations itself, very extensive process and, and really analyzing um, what does it mean to be a young peace builder on the ground. And it, it, it cuts across the five pillars in, in the 20 to 50 resolution. So 2419 came after that study was presented to the council. That progress study was presented to the council and the council took it up and said, we welcome this uh, study um, and then laid out um, uh, another step towards this process, asking the secretary general to su submit a report on youth peace and security. But also one of the highlights in 2419, and again, I don't want to say that it's, it's, it's my office and my work, but at the same time, I did a lot of work into really pushing to get young people involved in peace processes. So, you know, when peace negotiations happen in closed rooms, how can we get young people to sit in those rooms, sit outside those rooms, sit around those rooms and, and use their influence to influence negotiated peace agreements. So 2419 actually had language um, calling for governments to include young people in peace negotiations and peace processes. So. Again, another reading material, if you are interested in that, is a policy paper that my office did. It's called We Are Here. Uh, we interviewed about 40 young people who have somehow been involved in a peace process and, and ca collected their experience and their challenges and their opportunities and, and really laid out what needs to be done to meaningfully engage young people in peace negotiations. 
So after that, the Secretary General's report, <clears throat> sorry, Secretary General's report was completed and the Secretary General and myself, we presented the report to the Council this year in April. And um, the report had some very concrete recommendations, also building up on what the missing piece said, uh, but really giving some strong recommendations to both UN and governments when it comes to advancing this agenda on the ground. The best thing about the new resolution 2535 is that it gives that those recommendations in the Secretary General's report, most of them have been incorporated in this new resolution. So for an example, it calls for the UN's political and peacekeeping missions to have dedicated capacities for youth. So youth focal points, so youth advisors. Um, it is asking to the Secretary General to develop a protection guideline for young activists, particularly for young activists working on peace building, because we've had the experience where young people would come, they would speak at the Security Council, they would work with the UN mission in their country, and because they are affiliated with the UN, they face retaliation from their government or from armed groups or, or different groups in uh, their countries. So uh, the, the protection of young human rights activists uh, for for working with the UN, but also doing doing important work in their communities. Third and the most important thing is the youth peace and security agenda always went from one resolution to the other. We had 2250, then we have to look forward to 2419, then we have to look forward to another one just to keep the topic in the council itself, in the council's agenda itself. Mm -hmm. Some of you might know, not all member states believe that youth should be a topic for discussion for the Security Council. So for me, the biggest achievement in this resolution is the Council calls for a report by the Secretary General every two years. So we don't have to no longer wait for a new resolution every year to give that mandate to the Secretary General, but this resolution kind of gives that mandate to the Secretary General until it's, it's ended. To, to continuously update, report, progress to the Council on the implementation of youth peace and security. So when, when the Council gives a very strong implementable mandate like that to the Secretary General, and then on OP16, you will see that there is also a specific mandate to my office to strengthen the coordination within the UN um, uh, and also track the implementation progress. So when the Council gives you the mandate to do that, uh, then it's very, I'm not saying it's very easy, but it, it gives me and those who are working on youth peace and security within the UN a lot of space to hold those who are responsible accountable because at the end of the day now, every two years, they have to report back on progress. So these are some of the things that, that I really, really um, uh, value in this new resolution. And, and I hope that this will be also huge um, entry point for us to have some difficult discussions that we have been trying to have, have in the Council and beyond. Another important point, it, it's also reiterating the point that I made earlier, calling for direct investments to youth peace building organizations. So we, we can also use this as a hook to get more funders, go to get more uh, governments to actually put their funding into strengthening youth peace building organizations because uh, most of the youth peace and security work right now is done voluntarily. Like most of you know that even my office and, and the work we do, nothing is funded by the UN. So we, we fundraise and we, we find the resources to do the work that we do. And this gives us also um, that space to do that fundraising and, and to really um, get the donors on the table to, to be able to uh, put some money in, where our mouth is and, and advance the agenda. Um, sorry, I've been talking too long, but uh, but I, I'm very excited because it's 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 this resolution really puts yeah. puts fire under our feet. And, and no, we can we can it. definitely see how passionate you are, Jeff. Man, again, huge congratulations. I know we've got um, almost five minutes to go, so and the questions are coming in. So I'm just going to combine yeah. a couple of them. Uh, Ian, Noorin, and Damilola around. You know. What can people do on an individual basis to have their voices heard? How can they lobby their policymakers and leaders? And specifically in the context of developing countries, um, what, how can young people work on uh, innovative peace projects? 
because of the due to the constraints of funds and and how does this fit into the broader uh, SDG 2030 um, agenda the decade of action that the SG launched at UNGA last year um, in light of in light of COVID uh, quite a few questions but um, I'm sure I'm sure you've got answers uh, up your sleeves Jeff but I know lots of people are, are keen to hear yeah I mean I I'll, uh, I'll try to be as brief as possible uh, the 2030 agenda um, uh, I mean, it's even before the pandemic, we were definitely not in track, not on track to achieve all the targets and all the goals that were that are in the 2030 agenda. Even though member states signed up for it in 2015, we have seen very little commitment when it comes to actually putting those words into action. So uh, I really, really hope that many governments see this as an opportunity, COVID-19 and the recovery of COVID-19 as an opportunity to really integrate SDGs into their work. But also it makes you think if you actually had SDGs implemented, the impacts of the pandemic would not have been this severe and would not have been this hard because then you would, ha you would have had universal access to healthcare, you would have had universal social protection, you would have had ways to collaborate and cooperate across your differences, um, you would have had ways to take care of your water and land and environment. Um, but but I, 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 my, my sincere hope is that this will open up people's mind our leaders minds into into using the sdgs as a framework to build their recovery plans when they are um, when they're formulating those to come out of the pandemic um, if not i think we are making ourselves willingly vulnerable to more pandemics than than covid you know the, the the pandemic of poverty and the pandemic of inequality it's going to hit us so hard in 2030 if we do not reach these goals outlined uh, in, in the 2030 agenda so it's certainly there's a lot that needs to be done and i i really hope that you guys will continue to raise these questions and continue to hold those accountable those who are in power accountable on the question of what can individuals do um it's uh, it's a difficult question to answer because there's so much you can do. And, and there's also sometimes a feeling that it doesn't matter how much I do as an individual, what difference is it going to make? And I, I also personally constantly kind of find myself in the two extremes. You know, one day I'm like, yes, it doesn't matter. Every small thing I do, it can make a change. And on the other day, I'm like, okay, I'm doing this thing, but there's seven other billion people who are not doing anything. So why does it matter? <laughs> But uh, every time I feel like that, I always go back to Greta Thunberg because she started her work alone. Like when she was protesting in front of the Swedish parliament, people thought she was crazy and nobody, uh, there were even media reports talking about like that she's out of her mind and that she's doing something futile. A few months later, one, pe one person, two person, three person, and now over four million people have joined the movement that she created. And that gives me hope and that tells me that I'm not crazy and that, uh, you know, you have to start somewhere, right? So for an example, um, the organization that I co-founded back home in Sri Lanka, Hashtag Generation, when we started it, we didn't have a single dollar with us. We were all university students, the four of us. We got together in the kitchen of one of my friends. We didn't have an address, so we used her home address to get uh, apply for grants and everything. We applied for a million grants, never got a single dollar. But then one day we came across this uh, one grant called, from an organization called Frida, where they said, you don't have to be a registered NGO. You can be a youth organization. We are going to give you a thousand dollars in six months. Show us what you do with this thousand dollars. And then we will give you another thousand dollars. And then we will give you five thousand dollars. And we we applied for that. We got that. And then it's it was only an upward journey from that point. And just yesterday, they sent me pictures that they moved into their new office space. Even though I'm not a part of the organization anymore, you know, my, my three my friends, uh, three of my friends, they continue to, to run that organization. So I just wanted to share that with you because sometimes it feels like your individual work or your the small things that you do through your organization in your community cannot make a big difference, but it really can. Because even if you don't know, there is somebody else somewhere out there, there's Zai, there's Fatima, there's me who is trying to do the same thing that you are trying to do. and at, 
and definitely at some point today or in 10 years we are all going to come together and our generation is going to make this change that is so desperately needed in our world so i would say have faith and and continue to do what you're doing and those of us who have access to these platforms and institutions we will continue to try to dismantle this discrimination from within the institutions and and try creating more and more spaces for you and and your peers to be able to do your work most effectively thank you thank you Jayatma. i i think we um the time is 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 uh, is finished but uh let's uh let's end up with with this last uh question because i i see it very very interesting uh from Karen, she's saying like do you uh do you also have a series of concrete good uh, practices from decision makers about inclusion uh, of youth on, on your blog uh, and the second part are there some uh, you succeeded to bring to act uh, concretely sorry the, what is the second part are there are there some you uh, some examples or or uh, those you know uh, uh, some examples you succeeded to bring to act right okay so um, on that question one of the things that I've done is to work with a number of partners on the SDG implementation and looking at how young people are involved in SDG monitoring and follow up and refers that you are asking for in the question, please uh, read the paper Believe in Better. Uh, we launched this paper a couple of weeks ago um, and this is an extensive study we did with young people looking at how in their own municipalities, in their own townships, in their own countries, how they contribute to SDG implementation and monitoring and review. And what's interesting there is sometimes you have young people working from within institutions so that so you can see um, young people being part of um, the voluntary national reviews that governments are doing on the SDG implementation. You can see young people as researchers and data collectors joining the ministries of planning and, and finance to, to gather data from unreachable areas. You can see organizations like the Girl Guides or the Scouts partnering with ministries and, and government institutions to analyze that data, to raise awareness about the SDGs and, and bring a different dimension and different perspective into the work that the government is doing. We also have examples where in certain governments when it's not, say, not very conducive for you to work directly with the government, we have also seen how young people use marches and protests and demonstrations and writing letters to their congressmen or, or senators or their parliamentarians. We have groups like Not Too Young to Run in Nigeria who have developed their own youth movements to bring more young people into political parties, into parliaments. So not to just advocate, but to be the policymakers themselves. You know, you elect yourself, you 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 run a campaign and, and you become the policymaker yourself. We've also seen how how um, young activists do say shadow reports. So when the government puts out a report saying we are perfect, we are implementing all the SDGs and these are our numbers, there are youth organizations who put out a report that mm, not so much, you know, we are lagging behind in this area, our human rights record is like this. So we've also seen this kind of different tactics and different strategies that youth organizations use to really influence processes. And, and um, we call this, um, in the peace process we work we did we found the same thing and we call it the onion approach so in, like the layers of the onion you have young people inside the room in the decision making seats making that change you also have young people outside the room so those who are like Adv uh, youth advisory panels like uh, Denmark has a youth advisory panel to the Minister of Climate. New Zealand has a youth advisory panel um, to uh, their, I think, to the minister responsible for environment and climate. Um, so the, these are some of the young people who are around the room. So as advisors, as researchers, as support staff who are trying to bring about change within institutions. And then there are young people who are around the room or, or outside of the room but not in the close proximity, but from a large proximity on social media, on the streets, through demonstrations, through protests, trying to bring about change. So all of these examples are in, you can look at them at the in the paper Believe in Better. 
and in uh, the paper we are here that uh, that my office commissioned uh, last year and this year respectively um, yeah i hope that answers your question but uh, uh, that's you that's that's that like also we have seen extremely together also so uh, <laughs> So at the end, uh, Jayatma uh, Atom, uh, on 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 behalf of Extremely Together, uh, I want to thank uh, all of the attendees. A special thanks to you, Jayatma, for such an inspirational, nice points uh, that you mentioned. Uh, and for our attendees, please, if still you didn't take the survey, the online survey, click on the link. Go ahead, it's going to take a minute from your time, but you are going to support us in the development of the policy uh, note. Uh, the last word with you, Fatima. Thank you, Zaid. And I love that you, you lovingly have told everyone that your nickname for me is Fatoum. So thanks so much. <laughs> I'm a serious PVE activist. Um, I think everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. You heard it from Jeff, Matt. You have to persist. You have to be inside the room, you have to be outside, you have to be banging on the doors as well as sitting in the chairs because we have to have our voices heard. Um, and on that note, I want to express our deep thanks to Jeffma and everybody who's tuned in um, for these, for not just today, but the Extreme Together digital discussion series. Thank you for your questions. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get through all of them, but we only have Jeffma for a limited time. So with that said, Zaid and I have been Extreme Together. Jeffma has been the UN Youth Envoy. You've all been brilliant. So thank you so much. Stay safe, stay healthy and have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much Thank for you. having me and all the best to everyone. Bye, Jeff. Thank um, you. Bye. 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 Bye.